Welcome to the Steve Ames Show with the guitarist Sandy Renda, pianist Mike Yanuzzi, and my special guests, entertainer Len Carey and author Andy Mealy. And now, on with the show. <laughs> Lovers make no rendezvous To stroll along Fifth Avenue When this familiar world is through Will you still be mine? When cabs don't ride around the park No windows light the summer's dark when love has lost its secret spark, will you still be mine? When moonlight on the Hudson's not romance and spring no longer turns a young man's fancy, when glamour girls have lost their charms, when sirens just mean false alarms, when lovers heed no call to arms, will you still be mine? When moonlight on the Hudson's not romance and spring no longer turns a young man's fancy, when glamour girls have lost their charms, and sirens just mean false alarms. When lovers heed no call to arms, will you still be mine? Thank you. Will You Still Be Mine, written by Matt Dennis and Tom Adair. And now here are the two mighty musicians at the guitar, Sandy Renda. And at the piano, Mike Yanuzzi. Some movie memories now from the MGM film Strike Up the Band, starring Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland. And this beautiful song came from that picture, written by Arthur Freed and Roger Edens. <laughs> Our love affair will be such fun, will be the end of everyone those famous lovers will make them forget like Adam and Eve and Scarlet and Rhett when youth has had its merry fling we'll spend our evenings remembering two happy people who stay on the square isn't ours a lovely love affair? Our love affair was meant to be. It's me for you, dear, and you for me. We'll fuss, we'll bother, and tears start to brew. But after the tears, our love will smile through. I'm sure that I could never hide the way I feel when you're by my side. And when we're older, we'll always declare, isn't ours a lovely love affair? Sandy Renda, welcome back to our favorite indoor taping location, the beautiful Hilton Garden Inn in Springfield. You love it here. Beautiful hotel, very nice. The room, spacious, really, really nice. Very nice. Um, what do you and Mike have planned for some jazz tonight? Well, this, this is a great one. You can do this many different ways in a jazz feel. We're going to do it like a little Dixieland 2 feel. It's called Back Home in Indiana. Let's hear it for Sandy and Mike. <laughs>
My guest this evening is a multi-talented entertainer with a show business career spanning 70 years. He's been a musician, singer, band leader, comedian, and he's still going strong at the age of 91. Please welcome Len Carey. <laughs> Up and down to get you in a taxi, honey. Better be right about a half past eight. Now, baby, don't be late. I'm gonna be there when the band starts playing. Remember when we get there, honey. Two steps we're gonna have on wall. Dance on both of our shoes when they play those jelly roll blues. Tomorrow night at the dark town struggles for Hey, you bring up the Yaku Quatta Juch. The man I said I ought to mention. For Jimala Punda man, whoa, Zoto Basha man, a merrier girl they want to watch. Also, no mafan water. For Jimala Tarandel, hey. A darandel a bell To man I say it only on the city hall Let's go, here we go I'll be down to get you in the taxi, honey Better be right about a half past eight Now, baby, don't be late I'll be there when the band starts playing Remember when we get there, honey Two steps, we're gonna have them all Dance on both of our shoes when they play with those general blues. Tomorrow night at the Dark Town Strutters Ball. Are you from Brooklyn? Tomorrow night, Dark Town Strutters Ball. Yeah. I'll play the song. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that's pretty good. Len Carey, welcome to the show. Welcome. That Thank was a beautiful you, number of Darktown Strutters Ball. You like that? I loved it. And welcome to the show. Thank you. Andy everyone. Mealy, the author Thank of you, a new Steve. book. Let's hear it for Andy. Andy, tell us about your book. Well, the book is called Before the Echoes Fade, and it's the life story of Len. Uh, he and I were together in the 80s, producing shows for senior citizens. And when I got the idea to do a book about him, I got a hold of him. We hadn't seen each other in about 30 years. And uh, we met and we talked, talked over old times, laughed. And then I said, look, uh, you want to go through with this? You want to really do it? And he said, yeah, but you better type fast. I'm 90 years old. <laughs> so I typed as fast as I could, and we got the book out. And I read the book, and I loved it. It's I'm a wonderful you. book, not only a great biography of Len, but you mention many other show business people like Spike Jones and yeah. Billy Barty and my good friend Uncle Floyd right. and our mutual friend who's sitting in the audience, Mr. Bill Turner. Let's hear Bill. it for Bill Turner yeah, in, the, yeah. in the audience. Let's hear it for Bill. And Bill, Bill. Bill Turner is responsible for you two being on the show tonight. You exactly, know? yeah. Because I yeah. know that Bill used to be in your band, right, right. Uh, Len? And I was in his band, too. You were? Yeah. Very good, very good. Now, Len, you've had a long career. I believe you started in show business in the 1940s. Uh, I put the quintet together in 1949. Very Before good. Before that, I had a big band. Uh, a good friend of mine, believe it or not, was Buddy Rich. Uh, I haven't played drums as good as him. But you're stepping on my wire. Get off my wire, will you? <laughs> All right. Okay. But... Um, there was a kid that lived in Staten Island. His name was Tommy Harp. And uh, he, had, he was a very nervy guy. So I was in the Navy, and I, went, I was in San Diego, and I went to L.A. because Buddy Rich had his own band at the Palladium. And I look in the wings, and there's Tommy Harp from Staten Island. All right, now I'm in Los Angeles. So, so I, look, I look and I wave to him, and he comes down, he hugs me on the dance floor and everything. He says, what are you doing here? What are you doing? He says, I'm the role manager for, for Buddy Rich. So Buddy and I got to be friends because 
he his car was being painted, and he had a date with Lana Turner that day. Wow. And and I said, well, I said I have a forty one Mercury. If you want to borrow it, I saw only you would do that as yes. So we became friends. All right, through the years, and when he broke up his big band, I said to to um, uh, Tommy Harp, I said, what's he going to do with the book? What book? I says the the the, the, the arrangements. Because sort of Finnegan, Bill Finnegan had written most of his arrangements. Great right? arrangers, yeah. yes. So I, I says, can you get me the book? So he got me the book. So it had five trumpets, four trombones, five saxes, and four rhythm. So I had to amp uh, enhance the band. I had to put more people in the band. And I was losing my shirt. I got out of the Navy in 46. From 46 to 49, I had a big band. Oh, by 49, I was, I said, that's it. Big bands are on their way out. So... I started the quintet, and that's how I started with the quintet. Went on the road, we were on the road for 18 years. That's amazing. Yeah, man. There those you go. were great days, those oh, they band were great days. days. Yeah, the 50s was a good. You traveled good all over the country. All over the country. What were your favorite towns to play in? Well, number one, New Orleans. Oh yes. New Orleans. Love New Orleans, man. New Orleans, and we were a big hit at the Dream Lounge on Bourbon Street. Uh, we went in there with a two-week with option contract, and we wound up staying for three months. That's great. The, the owners liked this, okay? And the owners were two retired pro football players that owned the place, all right? And uh, our opening night opening night was really something. They had a barker outside, you know? You step right up, right, folks. Like uh -huh. in the circus. Right. right. So there were, this is a 300-seater, 300 seats maybe. Maybe it was 40, 50 people in the place when we first went on at 9 o'clock. And as we're playing, 10 minutes, 15 minutes into the thing, the people are coming in, hand over fist. The whole place filled up in five minutes, 300 people. And then 20 minutes later, they all started to leave again, and we're in the middle of the show. So I stopped this, and I went into a better tune. And I stopped this, I went into a better tune. I stopped, I went into a better tune. But before you know it, 10 minutes later, the whole place was empty again. Ah. And when we got off, I looked at the owners. I said, I guess we better pack up our instruments and go back to New York. So he said, you think we ought to tell him? And I said, tell me what? He says, those are bus tours. He said, they're going to come in here for one drink. Ah. He said, they're going to leave no matter what, because i got to go someplace else. But... He says, do you any, do any blue material, you know, risque? Right. I says, I can do a whole burlesque show if you want me to, all right? So he's give them the dirtiest material you got when they're here because they after they get through with the tour, they're going to come back here. And he was right. He was right. So that's how come we stayed there all of that time, like, you know. But New Orleans is a great town, right. great and town. You also played in California quite a bit. California, yeah. I played in L.A. Uh, oh, God, we, we played all over And LA. Las Vegas. Vegas. Las Vegas, Reno, Lake Tahoe. And that's where you met, I believe, you met Spike Jones? I met Spike Jones in Reno. We were at Harold's Club. He was working at the Riverside Hotel. And Harold was a Spike Jones buff. So he called him up and he said, would you like to come and see this band? I think you ought to come and see this band. And I was fronting my own band. I had a seven-piece band there at the at the Harold's Club. And the name of the band was Len Carey and his Cracker Jacks. Len Carey and his Cracker Jacks. That was the name he went under. Yeah. So uh, we had to do an extra show because uh, we'd be through work by the time Spike did his second show. So he says he says do an extra show and I'll pay you for it. Harold said I was okay. So we did it when we got through. He says come here and he introduced me to Spike. That's when I first met him. Like you know. And you had always been a big fan of Spike Jonze's Oh, I always band. loved him because I did musical comedy and he did musical comedy. The only difference was we were just a band. He was a star. Right. Uh, you know? I know. So when he saw the band, he liked the band. He said, boy, you guys are great. He said, you going to do this again tomorrow night? He said, I want to bring his whole band up to see my band. Like, you know? So he came up the next night. We did a whole different show. And he says, how much material you, got, you guys got? I said, we've been together 10 years. I says, we got a little bit of material, like, you know. So that's how I wound up meeting him. And then we wound up working at the Riverside Hotel. And he was in the main room. And we were in the lounge. And that was in November of 57. In May of 58, I got a call at my mother's house. I'm having macaroni on Sunday afternoon. And the phone rings. Pick it up. He says, Len Carey there. I says, this is Len Carey. He says, how the hell are you? I says, who's this? I says, Spike. And I says, Spike. Who do I know named Spike? The only guy I know is Spike Jones. I says, Spike Jones? He says, yeah. I says, were you in New York? He says, no, I'm calling you from De Beverly Hills. He says, listen. He says, I'm going to take over the Dean Martin show for the summer on, uh, on ch uh, 
Channel 4 was NBC. NBC. Yeah. And, uh, and he said, I'd like you to be on the show. And believe me, that's the best way. Steve, the best way to get hired is when they call you. Right. Okay. So how many TV shows did you do with Spike Jones? Uh, I did a, uh, we did eight shows. Eight shows during the summer of 1958. These were one-hour variety shows. No, half-hour. Half-hour half variety. Half-hour variety shows, yeah. And that's when you worked with Billy Barty. Billy Barty, yeah. Well, Billy Barty and I, when we went, after the shows, we went on the road. I went on the road. I stayed with Spike. In fact, I signed a contract with him, and I, a year's contract. I had two one-year contracts consecutively, consecutively. And when we were on the road, I roomed with Billy Barty. Him and I used to room together. Very talented man. Oh, God. He's three foot one of uh, all, just all talent. He could do it, it all. It oozes out of him, like, you know. And you did a lot of comedy routines oh, with him. Oh, yeah. With, and with Spike, we, him and I were like a comedy team in his show, like, you know. I did Ted Lewis. He was my shadow. <laughs> uh, he did D. Martin. I did Jerry Lewis, all right? We did all a lot of things together. And there was a Frankenstein routine, too. Frankenstein. I was Frankenstein, and he was my purple people leader. He was my interpreter. That's wonderful. Because Frankenstein, all he does is growl. You know, That's rawr. wonderful. And Cinderella, I was a fairy godfather. Like, <laughs> How did you like working in front of a live audience on live television? Oh, the best. The best. And, and I, I made mistakes on every show because uh, I was a musician, thrown onto a TV, into a TV show, like, you know, for the first time. And uh, between the dress rehearsal and the show, they set your lights. So I was, on the first show, I was doing Purple People Eater, and Billy was gonna dress as the Purple People Eater himself. He was gonna be on stage with me. And they set my lights, and they put a piece of tape down there, like an X. So I saw the tape, and I saw it, and they says, when you come on, there's your spot. All right, now between, then I was the first guy done. Then I went in the dressing room and the show went on and here comes Len Carey jumping and when I get out there, the floor is full of tape all uh. over the place. Cause everybody had to be taped for their lights during the show. And I didn't know that, like, you know, so I said, well, here goes. And I jumped on the wrong one. I jumped in front of my tape, uh -huh. that, which means I was silhouetted, silhouetted, like, you know, and Billy Barty, Mr. Show Business, he grabbed me by the seat of the pants and he pulled me back into the lights, you know. The best guy in the world. Oh, wonderful! I and had nothing but fun. So you did that one year, summer of 1958, 50, a television show. Fifty television show. Then I went on the road with Spike, and we worked in the. I think we went to the Tropicana right from the show, in Vegas. Then we went to the Mapes Hotel in Reno, and uh, Harris Club in uh, in uh, Lake Tahoe. Then we did an auto show in Phoenix, Arizona. That was a lot of fun too, like you know. So you were really busy. Oh yeah. Then we worked the Sahara, and when we were in the Sahara, uh, Louis Primo was in the lounge. We were in the main room, and w uh, one the last thing we did before our finale was Billy Barty was Louis Prima, and I was dressed in drag. I was Healy Smith. Oh, that must have been great. And Louis Prima fell off his seat laughing at us, and then when we went in the lounge, he stopped the show. He saw us come in. He said, "Oh, wait a minute, hold it! Here comes Louis and Keeley." <laughs> <laughs> so Billy Barty jumped up on a table to take a bow. So I jumped up on a chair next to him and I took a bow with him, like, you know. Oh, that's and great. And then when we got off, he says, come here. He says, uh, he says, Keely, I'd like you to meet Keely. He was introducing me, like, right. you know. And she gave him a dirty look, like, you know, because Ralph Pearl, who was the, uh, the writer for the newspaper, he put a thing in his column that Spike Jones has got a guy that looks more like Keeley than Keeley. <laughs> <laughs> and I was a pretty ugly looking Keeley, let me tell you. So you worked with Spike Jones almost until the end of his career. Almost, almost. Until the end almost. Of it, right? I worked all of, all of 58 and all of 59. Right, and then yeah. you were busy in the 1960s, I believe, running your own nightclubs. I, I bought a nightclub in 1967, the Moulin Rouge in Staten Island. I was there for 11 years, 67 to 71. And I introduced all the show. We had floor shows every Friday and Saturday night, and entertainment six, seven nights a week. The other five nights, my band was playing there, like you know. And uh, Andy, how did you meet Len? Oh, uh, after I sold the nightclub. Well, Len, uh, Len uh, sold the nightclub in '78. Yeah, and and he started doing work for senior citizens. He was doing something called Diamond Little Speakeasy, and I was uh, got into the thing. I was a salesman. And I met uh, the people at the Club Benet, which is over in, uh, was in uh, South Amboy. I remember. Yeah, and I was selling senior groups to their place. And uh, it was the manager at the Holiday Inn that yeah. we both knew. 
who said to each of us, you know, you guys got to get together, you got to meet each other. And he introduced us. And we, uh, we just talked a little bit. And then I, I do remember the first show. I, I had booked the show. I had June Valley. And I went to Lenny and I said, look, uh, you want to take care of the music and do everything. And he did, he did his usual job and he brought his band and everything. <clears throat> and when, we, when I went to pay him at the end, it turned out that his pay came out to the same as my profit. So we said, hey, we might as well get together and just split everything down the middle and hope we have something to split. And that's, that's how we got together. And we started doing these senior shows. Uh, right. Every month we had a different theme, different entertainers. So Len was also performing and performing. producing. He right. was doing the band. And, and I knew of he, a thousand entertainers yeah. because of my nightclub. You know? But he'd, right. arrive, he'd arrive early and set the band up, set right. everything up, do the band. Do, he'd uh, play dance music for two hours while the people danced and had their lunch. Then we'd do an opening, he'd do an, a little opening for the show, and then we had our, the usual show. We did a Roaring Twenty show, to, and we called it Diamond Little Speakeasy. Very good. And then later on, we put another show together called Fantasy Island. Sounds like fun. And, we, and the I, bus, the bus, I had yeah, worked yeah. the Hawaii Kai on Broadway before I bought my nightclub. Uh, and in the main room, Sam Marquia had the Hawaiian show. He was from Hawaii, and he had a girl that did the introduction. All he did was play. He played the Hawaiian guitar, like, you know. And so when we did Fantasy Island, I called him. And I said, Sam, I says, can I book your show for me? He says, we're doing seven nights a week at the Hawaii Kai on Broadway. I said, no, these shows are in the afternoon. We start 11 o'clock in the morning. We go till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So I had him, and we, he worked for us about 10 years, I would think, yeah. wouldn't you say? Yeah, he, was yeah. he died while he was working for oh us. Oh, my God. And, and Luana, yeah. the, the, the mistress of ceremonies, yeah. she wanted to give up the thing. I said, no, I said, Sam would like you to continue on. So after he died, we had the show for five years more after that with her as the leader, like, you know. That was the Hawaiian the show. The Hawaiian show, So you show, did yeah. these theme shows. Yes, yeah, everything theme was shows. themed. Yeah. Like, for example, in January would be New Year's Eve. So he had a clock set on the wall, so three o'clock was midnight. Midnight, yeah. So it got to any countdown, everything, yeah, happy new year. We had, we gave them the, uh, the, the noise makers yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And it was, it was New Year's Eve, three o'clock in the afternoon. And I know that through the years you worked together for about 10 years, right? Oh, yes. Even more Give than that. Take, maybe a little more. Yeah, Throughout maybe. the 1980s. And the in, 80s. into the early 90s. Into yeah. the, and you worked with a lot of friends of mine, like Uncle Floyd. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Uncle Floyd was one of our best acts, let me tell you. Okay. He's one of my best friends, one too. Of, yeah. He's still a good friend. Yes. Uh, he, he wrote the forward the to the book. I haven't seen Floyd since, oh, God, 20 years Huh? Oh, when, when, we, when we met at the Italian uh, Tribune, that's where we had our meeting with him. Recently? Yeah, because we were writing the book. With the book. So, and we wanted him to write the, uh, the, the, uh, the forward of the book. book. Yes. So we're meeting there, and I'm sitting there, and he's talking to Andy, and I'm sitting there because in 20 years, I don't look anything like I looked like 20 years ago. If you saw a picture of me 20, I, I've changed completely. They say some people age... No, uh, you know, gracefully, and other people hit the wall. <laughs> I hit the wall, okay, because I don't look anything like I did 20. So he didn't and recognize you. Not right? at all. <laughs> We're sitting there, brother, and he said to him, well, why don't you ask Len? And he says, Len, he says, is this Len Carey? We're sitting there for 10 minutes having yeah, a conversation. Something. Didn't even, didn't he even said, know us. He said, I thought you brought some old guy with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, we've had so much fun with you. We want to have you back again. We want to have you back oh, again right. How about several right? times. <laughs> Definitely. And we want to have Andy back again. Let's hear it for Len Carey and Andy Mealy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. In his long career, Bing Crosby introduced some wonderful songs, like this one from the Paramount film Here Is My Heart, written by Louis Gensler and Leo Robin. Love is just around the corner, any cozy little corner. Love is just around the corner when I'm around you. I'm a sentimental mourner, and I couldn't be forlorner. When you keep me round the corner, just waiting for you. Venus de Milo, 
was noted for her charms. But strictly between us, you're cuter than Venus. And what's more, you've got arms. So let's cuddle in a corner, any cozy little corner. Love is just around the corner when I'm around you. Now Venus de Milo was noted for her charms. But strictly between us, you're cuter than Venus. And what's more, you've got arms. So let's go cuddle in the corner, any cozy little corner. Love is just around the corner when I'm around you. Thank you. Good night.